It is Monday, Stephen. We are back in the studio. Another episode of the Missoula podcast. Yeah. Good to be here with you. <laughs> great it really week. came in hard. <laughs> what a great weekend. Uh, oh. Are you exhausted? Dude. Western Montana Fair just wrapping up. Yeah. That was amazing. Yeah. What a blast. I know what your fair was like a little bit. Yeah. Mine was a lot different. Usually I do the rodeo, the rides. I did one and one thing only at this fair. What was that? Seroptimus bingo. Seroptimus bingo. <laughs> I, I did a little bit of bingo <laughs> as well. Um, we have a problem. I have a problem because of you. I am blaming you 100%. For, you, yeah. You, for, for those who don't know, I've walked by the bingo tent every year. The fair has been going on. I'm like, why, why are people in there? Yeah. It is the most fun. It's a dollar per board. You can sit there for hours. For 40 years, I've never played bingo at the fair. Yeah. And then you text me Friday that you were playing bingo. And that's, I, our, new, that's our new tradition. I got there as quickly as I could. Uh, that was Friday. Saturday, I was playing bingo. And this group of ladies got up and left. And they everyone started clapping and they applauded because they had been there for eight hours. Whoa. And I was like, that's my future. Yeah. This is who I'm becoming. Yeah. Um, how about the food? Food was good. Went went for the Vikings. Did you? That was the only food that I had there. What'd you do? That's it. That's all you had. That's, that's all you need. I had Vikings. Uh, I had tacos. Cheese curds. <laughs> Dole Whip. The tri-tip sandwich. Sweet Adeline's nachos. The teriyaki chicken and fried noodles. A Philly cheesesteak and half of my fry bread because I just could not take any more. Dude, are you detoxing today? <laughs> I am. Well, no, my wife and I, we were there. So we're there Friday night and we got food and then we were there Saturday and got food. And truthfully, we shared most of this. Okay. And it was over the course of three days. So it, we didn't get the same thing twice, but I uh, tried a little bit of everything. And I got to tell you, the the Vikings are legit. I mean, they're a staple. Sure. You know, no denying that. Um, I'm not a huge cheese curd guy, but these cheese curds were solid. Like the saltiness, the they were good. So, so you're saying that was the number one food that you experienced? I might. I think I might put the cheese curds up there. Okay. They were good. Okay. They were good. Good but, to know. Well, yeah. it was a fun time. It was a blast. It's always fun every year to have this cap the end of the summer. Yeah. And I'm so glad that we now have an addiction which is bingo and actually our guest today spent a lot of time in that tent with us katie thies bala yeah and she she and i'm i don't like her still because she actually ended up winning she did win some money friday night uh and then laughed at all of us waved the money and then yeah uh, but our time's coming it is but yeah no uh great conversation with katie it was so much fun hanging out with her nick our producer um you and your wife just at the fair just hanging out and just the sense of community like the fair really was uh almost a metaphor for the missoula podcast just community coming together so many stories so many different people i did think it'd be cool if we could do a couple of live episodes from the fair next year uh, i want to have a carney on as a guest absolutely just hear their why just tell me your story like what what is it or the, the fair board member or the managers you yeah, know, the rodeo clown, something. Just be fun. I don't like to throw out promises, but I'm promising we will have a live broadcast yes. of the Bazoo podcast it. at the fair next year. I don't know any of the details. We'll figure it out. We're gonna figure It'll it out. It'll happen. Nick, that's your job. <laughs> um, but no, uh interview today is with Katie. Uh she a couple of years ago, um, she's changed careers a few times and shares that story, but most recent is she is co-owner of the Prairie Sisters Vintage Market, who has hosted events at the Western Montana Fair, or on the fairground property uh, at the Historical Fort in Missoula. And so this conversation today is a conversation Stephen and I had with Katie, heard her story, where the Vintage Market is going to be future. So take a listen. Katie Thies, welcome to the show. Thank you. Katie Bala. Here. Yeah, well, that is where we need to start. What is your last name? Oh my goodness. Um, so this has been 
screwing people up for years. Um, I am married to just a stud of a man, really, named Nick. Such um, a specimen. Yes. And you might know him as your producer, but he is, uh, he was nicknamed Nick Bala growing up. Um, you might think it would be a basketball thing, but it's something to do with skateboarding, I guess. And when we got married, I decided, you know, I think I'm going to take Bala as my like name on social media because he's Nick Ball on everything. Sure. So um, I wanted to look like I was married to him. So I was like, well, I'll be Katie Bala. And then also his mom's name is Katie. So I have the same name as Nick's mom. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he, he always says it's not weird because he doesn't call his mom Katie. He calls her mom. So. That there makes sense. Mm -hmm. I remember the first day I probably had known you as Katie Bala for six years. Yeah. And I saw a piece of mail that you had that said these. Mm -hmm. I felt so betrayed. Yeah. It, that's pretty much been how everyone has felt. We, I feel like it hasn't happened in a long time, but we would like consistently get people coming up to us and saying, I just found out your last name's not Bala. So I was at the fair this weekend, ran into someone and professional relationship and they asked if it was my first time at the fair and I actually said no I was here last night with Russets and the thesis and I said you know Steven and Nick and they said and I said Ballas and like oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so yeah. from here on out we're just gonna go Bala perfect yep. uh and Katie you are a special guest for the Missoula podcast because you are the first lady and that's an oversight by Brandon and I yeah, we should have had you first episode because we are looking forward <laughs> to this today. Um, but congratulations on being the first lady. Do you have you. An, a, an acceptance speech or anything you want to get out um, to your? Um, we'll wait until the podcast comes out and then. Okay. Yeah, we'll see. Awesome. If I, if I want to continue that title. Our producer's wife is the first lady of the Missoula podcast, and now I'm concerned that we're going to hear about it oh, yeah. from our wives. Yeah, we're in trouble. <laughs> we're, we're in a lot of trouble. Uh, well, Katie, you're, you're not originally from Montana. You've been in Missoula for 10 years-ish? Actually, it was eight years about three days ago. Eight years about three years Happy ago. Happy anniversary. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome to Missoula. Thank you. Uh, where are you from? Originally, I'm from a very small town in northern Minnesota. Okay. Like cold winter? Yep. Yeah, okay. yeah, like we always go home for Christmas every year and there have been, so I mean, it's been eight years. I'd say at least five or six of those eight years, it probably hasn't gotten above zero the entire time we're home for Christmas no. for like a week and a half. So so the obvious reason why you guys moved to Montana was for the winners. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I don't know about that. But they are a lot calmer here. Mm -hmm. I remember the first winter we had here, I was super excited because I never had to jump start my car. <laughs> so the stuff you so, take for yeah. granted here in Missoula. So, Northern Minnesota. Why Missoula, Montana? Out of all the places, how'd you end up here? Yeah. So I am a year younger than Nick, and we went to different colleges. Um, I went to a small private Christian school called Crown in Minnesota, and Nick went to NDSU, so go Bison. Mm. Oh. Um, <laughs> we're going to have to edit that out. <laughs> yeah. um, wow. But anyway, so we were, we were long distance the entire time we dated, um, but he spent his last summer in between his junior and senior year in Helena with a buddy of his from Minnesota who now also lived in Montana. Um, and so he kind of just fell in love with Montana over that summer and convinced me to move out here with him the next year. And I was going to live with one of his, um, with his buddy's girlfriend and he was going to live with that guy. And then we ended up getting married. So, uh, we moved out here the, about a month. Yeah. A month actually, exactly. After we got married, I had never been to Montana until the day that we moved here. My first Montana experience happened in Glendive, Montana really? at the retreat, which is like a dollar store version of Dairy Queen. So um, I got there and I did not have any idea what I was getting into. So that could not have been good coming into. Well, sorry for all our Eastern Montana listeners. Not a big fan of that side of the state. <laughs> um, were you like, what? 
Well, did, he kept telling I, me how beautiful Montana <laughs> was, and we stopped that night in Billings. And Billings, I feel like you kind of start to see a sure, little bit sure. of landscape. Um, but I thought maybe he had just tricked me into moving to essentially North Dakota. So <laughs> well, what's funny is Nick over here is just grinning from ear to ear. Like he's so happy, so proud of himself. Like he, yeah. he, he knows he pulled one over on you. Yeah, I, I don't know. I guess I trust him a lot. So what, what, what yeah. was your first impressions of Missoula when you got here? Um, that was a lot. It we got here and we only had like one week of nice weather before the smoke came. Um so that was super weird. And it, we moved here the year that actually NDSU and um, the University of Montana played the football game where the University of Montana beat them. I was yes, there. I was Last there play too. Of the game. Oh, it was so yep. great. Oh, yeah. So incredible. we got a bunch of crap for that right off What the happened bat. in the playoffs, though? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was when we moved here. So we kind of, I think we hiked the M that week and then it got kind of smoky. So I don't remember a ton about like the first little while um but then i just remember the fall being so beautiful i specifically remember frisbee golfing in october and wearing a t-shirt and being like what because in minnesota it's like a 50 50 chance that it's already snowed Mm -hmm. it's gonna stay snowing for the rest of the year so it was nice yeah and well we like having guests on that are making impacts in the in the community or that are driven well, well we have guests on of all different shapes and sizes but i love your journey because it's kind of been a winding road of of finding out what you're going to do so what when you got here what was your first career like what did you do for for money and then uh, lead us down that path of what you're doing now yeah so i have had a lot of different jobs just in my lifetime i guess to um I came from a family that like as soon as I started or as soon as I turned 15 and was like legally able to have a job, I had to start working. So when I moved here, I worked um, at Zootown Brew, the coffee shop that used to be downtown that is now Liquid Planet. And so I we moved here right before they renovated. So they renovated it. And then I was part of that new crew. So um, worked there for a while and I just kind of got. A little bit bored of it, I guess. I need I need to be challenged a little bit more than just like part time coffee shop kind of work, I guess. So, um, I got a job actually in the travel industry, and I worked at a company called Adventure Life, which is still in Missoula. Um, I worked there for I think a little over three years, and the first half of my time there, I was kind of like admin, front desk, answered phones kind of stuff. And the second half was actually being involved in the planning of the trips um, as an operations coordinator. So um, it was a very challenging job, just like heavy workload and um, just lots of crazy stuff happening. You never really knew what you were getting into that day at work. I might open my email and find out that there was a huge storm in Ushuaia, Argentina and the Antarctica cruise was going to be delayed. And I had to figure out flights and, you know, whatever else. So, cause we did, my specialty areas were Antarctica, um, Central America, Southeast Asia, and a little bit of the Arctic. Had you been to any of these places? Um, no, and I still haven't. <laughs> we did actually. Well, she's get to- an expert. <laughs> I I know so much about Antarctica for probably never ever going in my entire life because it's a very expensive place to go to. Yeah, how how much would one of these packages to Antarctica? Um, to cost? Antarctica, you're looking at probably a minimum of like ten thousand dollars per person. Um, most trips to Antarctica, you fly down to the tip of Argentina or Chile. And you cruise past the Drake Passage, which is like some of the roughest waters, to Antarctica. You see penguins. You see no people because nobody lives in Antarctica. And And then you cruise back? Cruise back. So do you even get off on the land? Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. You can, yeah, you can get off. But yeah, it was like small ship cruise stuff. But Nick and I did get to go to uh, Belize. Okay. So, yeah. So where is, for our travel people out there, an expert in the room, we got to take advantage of this. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Where is the spot that you can go that would be the best bang for your buck? So I feel like it- Bang for your buck. Okay, dad. It really, (laughs) 
It really depends on like what you're wanting to do, because obviously going to Antarctica is a lot different than going to Costa Rica, just climate wise. And I feel like the majority of people really want to go to a warm place for the most part. Antarctica is usually one of those like I've been to every other continent and I want to go to the last one. So I would say um, Southeast Asia is a pretty reasonable place. Um, we almost went to Thailand and then we decided that we would just go to Belize instead, just cause we didn't have quite as much time. So, um, Laos and Vietnam, I feel like everybody always is like, yeah, let's go to Thailand for Southeast Asia, which is like a great starter place, but there are some really cool things in Vietnam and Laos. Like, what do you, li- what do you like to do when you're there, when you're in <laughs> Vietnam and Laos? As the expert. As the expert. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding <laughs> my uh memory it's not like riding a bike so i would have to do a little bit more research to get i just remember those places no being that's great some, some cool ones yeah okay so then then you transitioned out of that the workload was too hard you were an expert so obviously there wasn't any yeah challenge. it's like i just you know i had reached my peak exactly. so <laughs> what, what did you do after that i really i spent a year where i was just kind of i felt kind of lost in like a career sense of not knowing what to do and trying to figure it out. I actually started um, like a hand lettering business uh, where I would like hand paint wood signs or do like chalkboards for weddings and stuff like that. So um, I had that going for a while, just kind of on the side because I'm a pretty creative person. So I needed like a creative outlet. So I did that for a while. And then I did, um, not as a full-time job. I made like $5. Um, (laughs) I like barely had to even file for taxes. It was not a profitable business. Um, but anyway, then I started applying for other jobs. I actually applied to be a flight attendant. Um, didn't get that job, which I'm very glad because I feel like that would not have been a good fit for me. Like you applied, interviewed and just didn't get hired. Correct. Yeah. Really? Yeah or Delta, I think. Wow. Hard yeah. to believe. I had to do like a video, like I had, I don't know, there was like something where I had to like record myself answering interview questions and you must have not had a great producer. Clearly editor. it didn't go because that was the end of the road for me. They did. <laughs> that was, yeah. What ended it. They didn't get back to me after that. So, um, but then I decided, I decided that I really liked working for myself. Um, but I also like having coworkers. Mm -hmm. So, um, I decided to look into real estate and the only realtor that I really knew was a guy named Jeremy Schultz and he is with ERA Lambros real estate. So I was like, well, I'll go talk to him. So I went to the office. He kind of chatted me about, chatted with me about how it works and you know, how realtors get paid and how they, what their job is, I guess. Um, and then he like walked me around the office, introduced me to a couple people in the office. And then at the end of it, I was like, so how do you like apply here? Is there like a application process to like get hired at this company? And he goes, Oh, if you want to work here, you can work here. And I was like, Oh, I didn't realize that this was an interview. I would have not wore jeans. Um, I cool. Okay. Good thing you didn't call Delta for reference. (laughs) I guess not. I'm still a sky miles member. I've forgiven them. Um, but anyway, yeah. So I ended up taking the uh, Canola Morton real estate class. Back then it was at, the, what was it, like Ruby's? Ruby's, Ruby's Inn. Yeah, that has been demolished since. We were the last class to ever be in Ruby's. Um, and they did a week-long 60-hour class where you went every day and learned how to not be a realtor because that class does not teach you anything. <laughs> Learn how to pass the test. It literally just teaches you a bunch of like legal stuff and you're not allowed to give legal advice as a realtor. So it was, um, yeah, I did pass my test on my first time oh. because I was very determined not to have to pay a hundred dollars to take it again. Right. Cause your sign business wasn't making money. Exactly. And yeah. So I, yeah, you know, you know how Nick is too with finances. He's a, yeah. he's a frugal man. He, <laughs> he didn't want to have to pay for his wife to not study enough. Yeah. A lot of pressure. So, yeah. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, so I took that. I had to finish out uh, some time at Adventure Life. I think I was there for like maybe three more weeks. And then I was a full-time realtor. And what, what was the biggest, I mean, you came in at a good time in the Missoula market, it yes. sounds like. Yeah. Uh, was it from the start just you were crushing it? What were some of the biggest challenges that you had? Uh, tell us about that experience. Because I think there's a lot of people interested in, in what it would be like to be a realtor. Yeah, for sure. So I think a lot of people have the idea that realtors can just kind of like have it as like a part-time side job and just like it's super easy to sell a house and you just like rake in the big bucks. Um, not true. <laughs> um, I think it took me seven months before I had my first sale. So um, the other thing that I think some people think is that when you're a realtor that you like get paid in other ways. You literally only get paid if you sell a house. And most brokerages, there's things like desk fees. There's fees that you have to pay for like lockbox access and um, just like other dues that you have to pay. And so it adds up. So most of the time you're paying to be a realtor if you're not obviously actively selling houses. So um, after that one, it kind of started rolling for me and I had a good, um, I guess, second half of my first year in real estate, um, had some good sales, had my first listing and kind of went from there. But this was back in 2019. Um, so I had my first sale at like the end of 2019 and then 2020 hit. And it was so, it was just such a weird time in real estate. I mean, we were like, after every showing, I'd be going to my listings and like cleaning everything. And I always had to make sure there were like masks and booties and all that fun stuff to um, have the people wear when they went through the house. So um, it was weird. It was, it started to get busy because people just like, were frantic. And then everybody started working from home. So they're like, okay, I don't even have to live wherever I'm living now. I can live wherever. So we saw that. And then at the end of 2020, I was approached by another realtor in our office. Um, and she asked me to be her assistant. So I was, I spent a year, a little over a year as a licensed assistant for, um, Marilee Valentine at URA Lambros. And it was just a fantastic year of just like learning so much. Um, she is excellent. She at what she does and just her process and her training. And so, um, I mean, I went from selling what six, seven houses my first year to being a part of like 30 plus or mm. probably 40 more. I don't know, a lot of deals That's with crazy. her. So I, I have never worked in real estate at all. I've bought and sold a couple houses, so I have a good idea. But in the last couple of years, I've actually learned a ton mm. um, because I started watching this documentary called Selling Sunset. <laughs> and I'm curious if that is what life is, is like exactly for you every day. It is exactly what, um, yeah, I actually have a Botox appointment right after this. <laughs> so um, it's exactly what it's like. Okay. For sure. Wow, um, that's actually you. how I studied. It came out my first year in real estate, and that's how I learned a lot of the things that I know. Amazing. Mm -hmm, for sure. Good show. What, <laughs> what, what do you love most about it? Like being in real estate in Missoula, and what do you, what do you hate most about it? Hmm. I like to be in control a lot. That's um, <laughs> probably my one of my biggest strengths and weaknesses. Um, which is why I really like being my own boss. Um, but also it, it makes me, it's, it's difficult, I guess, when you're working with somebody on the other side of the deal who maybe isn't quite up to par, mm -hmm. um, in real estate, because there are like 700 plus realtors in Missoula. Um, so not all of them are excellent of at course. their jobs, just like in any industry. So, um, I've been fortunate to not have many circumstances that have been super challenging or anything that I can't handle or whatever, but, um, it's hard when you have to wait on other people to get stuff done and when there, mm -hmm. there are oversights and stuff like that. So I'd say that's probably one of my least favorite parts of it. Um, favorite parts 
I love when you finally can get something like together for someone who's been looking for a long time and is just so deserving of a house. Mm -hmm. Um, I love working with friends. Um, I got, I sold Ben Weinman, his house, which was, they were some, yeah, some great, great clients. The first man of the Missoula podcast. Yes. The (laughs) first male first or something or something. So it's a good career. A lot of people are afraid of making that jump. They're like, I I think I'd be good at this. And and it sounds like there's some challenges that Mm -hmm. you've gone through. What would be a piece of advice that you would give them? to count the costs or to think about before they make this jump into real estate? Because obviously it's just not gangbusters. You're going to kill it from the start. There's a lot of learning to do. As you, There's as a you lot know. of learning and there are a lot of startup fees that I feel like people don't um, necessarily think of because when you're starting, you do have to get kind of get your feet on the ground. Um, you have to pay for the class to get licensed and you have to pay for the license and all that stuff. There's just, I mean, probably a couple thousand dollars worth of like startup fees that you have to pay. Um, I would say my biggest piece of advice is find a really good brokerage. There are pros and cons to all of them out there. Um, the one thing that I really love about my brokerage is that their training is just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Um, so I just have full confidence in my abilities to fill out the documentation that you need to fill out because there are so many forms um, that are legally binding contracts. So um, it's nice to have a brokerage that does like that really cares to train their people so that you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, That and then I would just say have a plan for um, maybe have some savings or something to be prepared to not make money for a little while because it is super common for it to take a while before you start really, yeah, getting some money coming in. Yeah. Uh, well, Katie, you're obviously still active in, well, being married to Nick, that's a full-time job, but yeah. also mm-hmm. real estate. Uh, but we brought you on specifically because you had another career transition where you brought on an, another adventure, if you will. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing now and, and that process and yeah, start there. Yeah. So I am, um, the co-owner. I, this is a 50, 50 partnership that I have with Cassie strong, um, of the Prairie sisters vintage market. So it was formerly owned by Laura Branson and she had a couple of friends that did it with her. Um, so it's been going, I think we're on year 13. Um, but we have been the owners since the first of the year. So, um, what is the vintage market? I, I know from being married to my wife, (laughs) whenever that word comes up, vintage market, she starts screaming and squealing, Mm -hmm. but maybe there's some listeners out there that don't know what it is. So what do you guys do? So we are a vintage market. We are the ones who host the market. So we get all the vendors and the location and all that kind of stuff set up. We host them all over the state of Montana. So far this year, we have been in Billings, Kalispell, Missoula. And then this fall, we'll be in Missoula, Great Falls, and then back in Missoula for a Christmas market. So um, you can find anywhere from like a really cool vintage piece of furniture or decor to a cool handmade item to a bag of puppy chow from our bakery family that we have at the market every time. So there's tons of stuff. We are primarily a vintage market, but we do have a select few handmade vendors as well. I, my wife and I, we went to the Missoula one this last spring and thank you for braving the rain. It Yes. Um, we did bring you a coffee as well. So they thank you for that as well. Cancel each other out. Cause your husband didn't, um, <laughs> No, uh, it's fascinating. The the number of people that show up early, like it's almost like a garage sale. Like People show up early with anticipation to be there and just to go through vintage furniture, clothing, jackets. And I thought going with my wife, like, hey, we're going to support Katie. This will be fun. It's just a Saturday afternoon. But how cool it was to actually look in, at how creative people are with mm-hmm. furniture, like restoring yeah. like old dressers and bookshelves to even like 
tools from a garage and like i thought one of the coolest things was you know like the gas station there's the signs that say like gas is like 398 a gallon and like the big plastic numbers like a guy had just like hundreds of those numbers and <laughs> people were buying those like like crazy for like five dollars just for a number uh, i just thought it was cool seeing what uh an event that brings together an, another community in missoula it's a huge operation it, i mean how many vendors do you have big time per event so each event varies a little bit just based on the vendor's availability because these vendors, some of them, it's like their full-time job. They're going around and doing markets around Montana, Wyoming, Idaho. Like they'll go down to Vegas and do a market. Um, I think for, so we have, our next market is on September 9th in Missoula and we are up to, I think the last time I checked, it was over 60 booths. Um, so it's going to be a good show. Crazy. Uh, where is that hosted? September it is 9th. at the historic Fort Missoula. Cool. So it's on the backside of that main building there when you pull up where the like pavilion is. So the gazebo thing. Yeah. So if I wanted to start my own hand lettering company and I did that, and I wanted to sell at your market. How, how does somebody go about that process? So if you just go to our website, which is the um, there's a tab at the top that says apply. Um, to apply for one of our markets, you have to give your name, your email, so the, obviously all that normal stuff so we can contact you. Um, but we also require at least three photos of your booth. Um, one common question that we get from a lot of people, because a lot of people are just starting out. They have never had a booth before. So they'll send maybe a picture of their product, but we are very adamant about getting actual booth photos so that, cause we use those photos to kind of figure out where would be best to place you at the market. If you're going to be a good fit for our market. Um, it's kind of, yeah, our stepping stone for getting into the market. Um, so we require, if you have not ever had a booth before to go and, um, set up a mock booth. So actually two of our applicants for our fall market, our September market, were brand new, super excited about them. They have some awesome stuff. Um, and they just went in the backyard, set up a little mock wow. booth and took some pictures of it. And so now we know kind of what their setup's going to look like at our market in September. So that's awesome. Well, we certainly love promoting the vintage market and what you're doing. And you and Cassie, uh, two women entrepreneurs and business owners, it's just so awesome. Is that what, what's been that challenge of running your own business? And are is it going well? I guess I, I don't know what I'm trying to ask here, but. Yeah. So Cassie and I have been friends for a long time. She actually lived in Missoula up until last spring. Um, fun fact about Cassie, she was my first ever sale in real estate. Her and her husband bought a house, um, that I actually just sold again because they just moved back. They're both originally from Billings, Montana. So, um, they had their first child about two years ago. He just turned two, I think in June. And so, um, both, since both of their families are there, they wanted to be back with their families. So they moved back. So, um, the reason Cassie's not here today is because she is literally days away from giving birth to their second child. So got it. The five hour drive with the risk of um, giving birth in the studio was maybe just a little bit too much. I think Chriselle was showing houses the day she gave birth on Selling Sunset. So I feel like that's <laughs> yeah. Well, Cassie's not a realtor, so uh, maybe okay. that's it's why the real estate. Okay. you yeah. would Makes be. Sense. Yeah, makes yeah. sense. I would. Okay, and I I could probably deliver yeah. a baby. Um, I've done it before myself, so it's it's you learn everything um she's an expert at everything i do she not does. and thank you to everyone at community hospital for <laughs> <laughs> helping me give birth to my child they were fantastic um but yeah so it's actually been really cool for our friendship it's i think it's really nice especially because she has moved to billing since we started the business um it's kept us in touch where i feel like when you move away a lot of the times those friendships start to fade but um we're forced to stay in contact. So we get to be in each other's lives as long as this business goes. So, um, I love having a business partner. It was something that we were warned about by the previous owner, 
just to be aware of because it is difficult to be in business with a friend. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things that we did was we wrote up a partnership agreement. Um, so we had specific rules on what's it going to be like if one of us has a baby and then Cassie goes off and immediately gets pregnant. So <laughs> she's cashing in on that. Um, but yeah, so we really were diligent about making sure that we felt like it was an equal partnership. We were equal in our duties and, um, I could not do this without her. She is a fantastic partner and friend. Um, the strengths that she have just fill my weaknesses so well. Um, what she's good at, I would just hate doing. And I think vice versa. Mm -hmm. We always joke that if there's an issue at a market, I'm the person to deal with it because mm -hmm. Cassie's a little bit more um, quiet and reserved where I'm not afraid of conflict, kind of more of the in-your-face sort of person. <laughs> Nick, <laughs> I love you. Um, yeah, so it's been a really cool partnership. Cassie is a freelance marketer in, we like to say, in our day jobs. Um, so she is doing that for, she has a couple clients that she does marketing for. And so she's kind of the behind the scenes marketer, whereas I'm the one taking the pictures and posting them. She's the one writing the captions and making cool. sure that they're getting to the right people. So yeah. that's awesome. And you guys have hundreds of people come through your doors at each event. Mm -hmm. um, and correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's one of the cool things you, you do is you have a ticket that people can purchase to get them early. Like, yeah. Saturday morning mm -hmm. market Saturday Sunday if you want to talk about that so our market is just on Saturdays um we set up everything on Friday so vendors do have to be there for two days because the setup process is pretty intense takes sure. all day um but yeah our market is for the general public is from 10 to 4 p.m and it's it is a ticketed event um and it's five dollars per person but we if you're 12 years old or under it's free because people do bring kids. Um, but we have a what's called an early bird ticket that gets you into the event an hour before. Um, and that is a $20 ticket. Gets you in an hour before you get to shop before the crowd because that line at 10 o'clock, like Brandon was saying, can get pretty long. Um, and vendors have one-of-a-kind items. So if you're really into the vintage shopping, getting there early and getting the first look at everything is really important to some people. And it's just a fun time. We always get them a little gift um, as well. That comes just with purchasing the ticket. So um, yeah, it's a fun time. The only one that's different is our Christmas market, which is my favorite market of the year. It's at the beginning of November. We have a two day market and the Friday. So we have the vendors set up Friday morning instead of Friday afternoon. And then that night we have our early birds shopping that night instead of Saturday morning. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that event is September 9th is going to be the one here in Missoula. September 9th in Missoula. We have October 7th in Great Falls. And then we have November 10th and 11th in Missoula. But that one's at the fairgrounds because it's November. So an outdoor market could be sure. a little chilly. Awesome. Can we, this, totally putting you on the spot, can we give away a ticket to the September 9th event on the podcast? Let's do an early bird ticket. An early bird ticket? Okay. We're going to do it. So, Here's the rules. You have to be the, let's go, we'll say number three. The third person to text Prairie Sisters to 406-888-MSLA gets a early bird ticket to the September 9th Prairie Sisters Vintage Market in Missoula. Love it. Got let's it? do two early bird tickets because shopping with a friend is so much better than shopping you by that? yourself. Wow. That's two amazing. Two early bird tickets, 406 888 MSLA, send a text, says Prairie Sisters. If you are number three, those two tickets are yours. Thank you. That's very nice of you. That was nice. Well, Katie, let's let's get you out on these. We got some rapid fire questions for you. Are you ready? I am so ready. Okay. Yeah. Right. Number one, Katie, what is your earliest memory of Missoula? My earliest memory of Missoula is arriving in Missoula. It was like dusk when we got here but our friends who lived here really wanted to show us around town. So we drove around town and got Taco Bell at the Taco Bell on Brooks. What, what's your go-to at Taco Bell? A absolutely a Crunchwrap Supreme. Oh, yeah. So, so good. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your favorite coffee in Missoula? 
That's a loaded question because it depends on where you're going. My coffee order depends on the coffee shop that you are going to. Of course. If I got to pick the coffee shop, it's definitely going to be Copper Mountain. Ooh. I love the diversity. We just started asking these questions and we have not got the same answer once. Uh, how about favorite restaurant in Missoula? Ooh. Hmm. Nick and I are not, we don't eat out a ton. Because he doesn't want to spend the money. We're pizza people. So maybe, maybe Mackenzie River. Ooh, yeah. Um, what zip code do you live in? 59803. The and South Hills, which Nick always says that they are called the Beverly Hills of Missoula. Beverly Hills. That's right. Yeah. Got a little view. I love Missoula because it's such a weird place. What is the weirdest thing about Missoula to you being a Midwestern Minnesota girl? This one, I feel like we're going to be circling back to the whole North Dakota debate that we started with. But um, being from Minnesota, we have what are called professional sports. <laughs> and so it's always been really weird to me how into college athletics people in Montana are. Sure. Because it's not a Packers versus Vikings. It's a Grizz versus Cats. And I will firmly say that I am, I am a Grizz fan. My sister yeah. attended the university by proxy. I say that, you know, that's, that's who I'm, I'm cheering for. Um, but it took me a really long time to understand why people were so excited about college athletics. Um, because I grew up as a Vikings fan, twins fan, Minnesota wild. And so it, it was a, it took an adjustment to not have the big, big name sports. Yeah. I think Missoula does have like, there are Grizz super fans. There's a lot of them where it's not just their fans, but they have like the Grizz spatula for the grill and, and the, the grill cover is Grizz. Yeah. It's, that's Steven. He mm -hmm. is, he yeah. is a super fan. So no, that's a very interesting perspective. And I think it's very accurate. Yeah. We don't have the amount of people we, so one of the things we do at the market is we do a little giveaway of like a little basket of goodies from the vendors or whatever. And all you have to do to enter it is give your name phone number and email address so that we can contact you if you win and send you an update when our next market is. And when we're entering in those emails into our system, the amount of emails that we see that have something to do with Grizz <laughs> is wild. <laughs> I love the Grizz 8200 at yahoo.com. Yeah. Like all yeah. Yeah. Grizz for life. Number Steve, one, one Grizz one, one. fan. <laughs> yeah. It's mm -hmm. awesome. Um, last question for you, Katie. What do you love the most about Missoula? I, the thing that I love most about Missoula is that there's something here for everybody. I think, I mean, you get all four seasons here. That's one of my favorite things about Missoula is that you get, you still get all the four seasons, but they're like not, I always say they're not as severe as they are in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting constantly eaten alive by mosquitoes in the summer, even if they are like bad in some areas. Um, but you can spend your day hiking while somebody else in Missoula is surfing, or you can spend your day like downtown looking at art while somebody else is at a concert. And there's just so many cool, even if they maybe are a little bit smaller scale than other bigger places. It's just, there's something for everybody. And because it's not so big, you're bound to run into someone, you know, Amazing. Check out the Prairie Sisters one more time. Where can they find information about it, Katie? We are on Instagram at the Prairie Sisters Vintage Market. And you can also find us on Facebook at Prairie Sisters. And then we have a website, which is theprairiesisters.com. And if anybody wants to buy a house from you, do they go to Katie Thies or Katie Bala? <laughs> it is Katie Thies. Yep. I thought that maybe would be a little bit. Actually, when I got my license, the uh, lady who does that at Lambros gave me a fat stack of paperwork and every single piece of paper said Katie Bala. And I had to tell her she had to go reprint it because that's not my last name. That's awesome. But I think I'm Katie Bala Thies on Facebook now. So right, right. Well, you will. We'll be forevermore the first lady of the Missoula podcast. Thank you. Thank you for being on with us and go check out the Prairie Sisters. Awesome. Thanks, Katie. If I don't see you soon. Thank you. We'll see you September 9th.